Hello, hello, and welcome to Hospitality and the Infinite Game, a podcast series focused on answering one simple question. What type of hospitality industry do we actually want to create? In these episodes, Michael and David discuss big ideas that might set the foundation for a different model of success. A model which would allow us to piece together a bold new way forward, where our businesses can thrive whilst making a positive impact on people, communities and the planet. We make no claims to have all the answers, far from it in fact, but we hope these conversations might just get you thinking. We are learning and hopefully you'll learn with us. So join us. The game is afoot and it's an infinite one. Yeah, welcome back to another episode of Hospitality and the Infinity Game. And uh, last time we talked about the, the donut, the donut e- economics, not the donut you can eat, but it probably is the donut we need to start eating if we want to create a better future for ourselves, a, a better place for humanity to live and thrive. And in within that umbrella and a very complex model, and if you... You, you were on the, the last episode, you, you've probably been studying the model and they said there's a lot of things within that. And there's actually an element of that model we're going to talk a bit about because that's probably the most progressive we've seen that's actually linking up to this model is called circular economy. And it's all about actually utilizing the resources we already have instead of just having a throwing away mentality. How do we actually get the best out of things when we do it, especially around you know, building and waste in a way. So David, uh, this is like uh, something you have been very interested in and something your business has spent a lot of time uh, thinking about Definitely. and also studying. And so I think it's a, it's, it's you that actually should uh, answer the question and I will will jump in. What is actually circular economy and why it's important? I'll, I'll try my best again for simple explanation. I, again, I, I actually wouldn't, I wouldn't call myself an expert. I've, we've read several books in it. We are really keen to see how we can move hospitality design, which is obviously our focus, to um, the principles of, of circular economy. Um, but there are many people out there who, um, <laughs> who who know a lot more than us. We are, yeah, we are students, as as in many parts. Um, I, I guess, what is circular economy? The whole point is it is around sustainability. So, so it is about how it's a system for how we can create a more sustainable society and way of living. So that's the core of it. Um, it's almost worth defining it by what it is not and what it's trying to change. Um, it's trying to move away from what we describe as a linear economy, which in really simple terms can be abbreviated as take, make, waste approach. Mm. Um, so if you simplify that, we take natural resources out of the ground, we combine them to make a product that people buy and use, and then when we get bored of it or it's broken, we chuck it in the landfill and we kind of forget about it. Uh, and clearly, that is a slightly oversimplified model, but that is not a sustainable way that we can that we can live as a planet we need to be aware that there are finite resources on this planet and we need to find ways to get the most out of them for as long as possible Um, so the circular economy looks to take that linear process and and bend it around on itself to create a circle whereby you almost remove the idea of waste altogether and again there's a nice analogy with nature you look to nature there is no concept of waste there's nothing. I mean, when a tree grows and dies, it you know falls over and breaks down and, and provides nutrients for the, all the, the wildlife and uh, everything else around it. So there is a circle in there, and we need to look at how um, we can systemically change the way we, we do things. Um, there, are, there are three key principles that sit at the heart of circular economy. Um, the first one, as I've mentioned there, is designing out waste and also pollution. So the byproducts of us doing things, how, how are we designing to get rid of that? Because that is all part of climate change and all the things that we're doing that are not so great for the planet. The second one is then, once we've made them, keeping products in, and materials in use for as long as possible. Uh, in a way, they talk about... Um, Uh, something called a value chain which is uh, how high can we keep these products in the value chain so as an example um if we talk about uh bricks so we've so we've taken resources out of the ground we've made bricks and we've built a wall with it 
and then five ten years later we come down we knock the wall down and we grind it down into rubble when we chuck it in the roads to use it as aggregate now in a way we think well that's a good recycling piece right we've we've taken these bricks and then we've turned it into an aggregate and we've put it into the roads but the putting it into the road as aggregate is a much lower value product than when it existed as a brick so it would be better to take that brick apart you know the wall apart piece by piece and then use those bricks to rebuild another wall which is which is you know is, is of higher value to us um so, so that question of how you keep things in use for as long as possible at their highest value is, is a core idea um and then the third part is about regenerating natural systems so understanding once you look at the circle of this how are we making sure that the natural systems that gave us those resources in the first place are being nourished? And that particularly applies to the world of food production um, as much as anything else. So those are the three core principles. And hopefully that was clear and simple enough to, for everyone to understand. Um, there is a fantastic um, foundation called the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. If someone wants to really understand a lot more about it, they are very good at communicating. They've got lots of uh, podcast um, episodes. They've got videos. They've got um, explainer PDFs. They're they're a pretty impressive organization. You can find out a lot about circular economy in there. Um, but I guess our next question is, how do those principles apply to hospitality, right? And, and is that an easy thing we can, we can start to make happen? Um, I think that the short answer is is no, it's not easy. And I, and I think, again, coming at this from a design perspective, we're looking at how we can change the way designs are, are, are made. Uh, how do we stop the problem of the huge amount of waste that's created through stripping out, building um, a restaurant, and then at the end of its life it being stripped out again? and then somebody else coming and building something. It's an incredibly wasteful process. So I can dip into that later about what we're doing to look at um, the restorative restaurant design project, because I think that framework could be interesting for people to think about how it then applies to other parts of the business. Um, but to make circular economy work, we really need, again, a systemic level of change. We need mm. to create these little mini ecosystems and, and, and loops for connections. Um, and I think that is also where the, the biggest opportunity opportunity lies. Yeah, I think it's, it's very interesting because uh, we both have started it uh, individually. And one of the things I, you know, really to make it really simple to understand for me, it's a bit like uh, children's clothes because I'm in that situation. Now my kids are between, you know, one and five, so they grow very fast, and they, you know, they, you buy clothes or you you inherit clothes. Yeah. And actually, we we actually made a, with the second child uh, because we be been been very aware about you know the, the clothing industry and what it does to the planet. We actually have much more clothes than we need. Mm. Everybody could actually have clothes on their bodies on the <laughs> planet <laughs> yeah. if it was just fairly distributed. But we, we were thinking a lot about how can we actually hand down clothes, but also how do we make sure clothes that we, we don't throw it away, but actually how do we give it to people that actually need it again? So then taking down an individual level, how can you actually keep it, things in flow in the chain yes. and actually use it? And I think clothes is just a very simple matter again comes down to food. How can you actually make sure food is repurposed? How can you take something that maybe is on the limit of actually, you know, going waste? And how can you ferment that? Yeah. And store that and actually, you know, speak exactly. that. And, and I, think I think it's that those are very simple things that you actually can do to participate. The circular economy in my world takes it down to something that is actionable compared to donor economics where we talked about the big macro here. Yeah. We're actually talking about actions behaviors exactly. where we can do something which exactly. is exactly the important bit of it yeah and what and what i really like about about circular economy when you look start looking at it from a company perspective is you realize you you cannot do it on your own it, it, it inevitably requires collaboration which to me aligns really well with some of the things that the hospitality industry is great at mm. yeah, and i think we need to find suppliers and partners and relationships with people to make sure we are doing good things you know if you're going to strip out your restaurant and let's be honest there are going to be a lot of those in the next 12 months how what's happening with that stuff how are you getting rid of that are you going to use a company like globe chain or clean conscience who will come and take this away and redistribute it in a way that it's not just going to get broken down and, and put in the skip and i think that building those 
you know, loops and flows are a couple of terms they use a lot in, in circular economy, which can seem a bit nebulous. But the idea is effectively yeah, finding relationship with people that make sure that we get rid of the idea of waste. There should be, really, there should be almost nothing that actually is waste. There, there is a purpose that we can we can use most things for. Um, there are other challenges beyond that, but how we design to make sure that can be happened. But that I'll come I'll come on to that a little bit later. Yeah. But yeah, collaboration, you know, and I, I think that is a really positive idea that comes out of circular economy is that we need to work together to do that. Um, yeah, and I think it um, to to again again, you know, you said that you know very sad situation. There's a lot of things going to be stripped out, and I've seen you know so many times that you rip out, you know, cafes, restaurants, and then it just put in a skip. And there's so much valuable because it's very expensive stuff somewhere and it's actually really good quality. Yeah. And it can actually be repurposed somewhere else. Um, yeah. Coming back to uh, the cafe chain I was part of, we were, uh, you know, and we came to that point where we had grown too much and actually became a, a problem for us. But also we had to, again, repurpose our cafes. They needed to be, mm. you know, look, you know, nice again. Mm. Uh, but we didn't have the money because we put ourselves in this trouble. So we had to, again. So the, one of the founders is very, you know, creative, and what he does is principal circular economy. He went round to look at the storage room, what we had there, and what else we had. And then he said, "Well, oh, all cafes don't have to look alike. So how do we actually start to give them individual soul?" And actually, he took, you know, old bars and then repurposed them, and actually created, you know. The only thing you maybe it's difficult sometimes is kitchen equipment, you know, mm. that's difficult to repurpose. It can be repurposed in some way and you can maybe get more out of it. But actually the whole thing was that actually we didn't spend much on refurbs. We actually just used what we had. And actually that was perceived by the customers a much more welcoming environment. The new concept has yeah. actually been <coughs> refurbished. I think and we were surprised yeah. about that. That we thought they liked the clean look mm. that we had at that point. We've gone in to become very lean very clean look actually we went back to become a bit more a bit more i wouldn't call it grotty a bit more authentic and there's 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 so much in there i don't even know where to start yeah i think that's that's really fascinating i think there's a few things um number one i would suggest your customers liked it because in, in the last episode i talked about the irrationality of, of humans and mm. how we respond positively to effort and seeing you make effort mm. and it sounds like from what you were doing yes there was a cost driver of that but you were being you were creatively putting effort in to make the environment better for them and i think that's also one of the secrets often with independent cafes and coffee shops is that we we don't we don't want them to spend money we don't want it to look expensive necessarily mm. there are some you know driven by status where that that is where you need to be at that end of the market but we we want to see them do something of you know effort so if they've upcycled something or taken a door frame or window and turned it into something else that is more effort than just ordering something off amazon and stick it in the corner and so that's the point for me is that there is there is interesting uh, an amount of effort in there that kind of communicates across to your customers and i think the other part is that there when we talk about sustainability very often there is a question of economics attached to this and you know i do meet a lot of people when we talk about things as i want to be sustainable as long as it doesn't cost me any more now that mm. is a very very challenging question because you do have to argue well are you actually do you really want to be sustainable or is it sort of a tax on peace but in the, in the example you gave there and i do think there will be a huge opportunity as well you know something like 10,000 restaurants are going to fail this year sadly there are going to be a huge number of fully fitted out sites that someone can go in and refurbish to us to a smaller level um, and not spend the same amount of money and have a successful business off the back of that. And, and that is where this frugality and sustainability have a nice, convenient alliance. Um, mm. And I think it's important to see that what you can what you can take from aspects of that circular economy is not being wasteful does have some can have some very short term ROI. There are other parts that that don't if you want to look at energy efficiency measures and you know insulation and and you know, heat pumps and, and you know new new build architecture when you're looking at things like that um but there there are definitely ways that this um circular economy principles can lead you to a kind of creative make do and mend um style of working um, so i do think that's a that is an interesting thing to to point out with with circular economy David, do you uh, right now? Are you working on you know any projects where you know you the, the 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 aim is to 
you know, really live out the, the circular economy principles. Yeah, we're, we're trying to do that. I mean, we've been um, working on the research for what we've called a, the restorative restaurant um, project for the last sort of six to nine months. And we developed this, this framework, which is effectively, if you can imagine a circle with three arrows going round on itself, there's, there's three segments. One, we're looking at the approach to demolition and strip out. So um, you have to go and audit a site and see what you can save. How can you work with the gifts of that site? Um, and then if you aren't going to keep some parts of that, what are you doing to, to get rid of that in the most um, responsible manner? How are you making sure things are kept at the highest value chain? So that's something we're looking at and looking at partners like Clean Conscience and Globe Chain and, and people who can help do that. Because you can get um, waste contractors at the moment who will say they, they will recycle 100% of everything they take away. But when you dig into it, you realize that some of that is incineration for, for energy recovery. And that counts as recycling, even though it, you know, it's not really, I mean, it, you, you can't say that's circular or sustainable. It's not really a, a high enough goal. So, so that's the first part of the, the, the theory of the restorative restaurant framework. Then you go into low impact design. And, and that's how it gets interesting for us because you start talking about assessment systems, whether you need to look at qualitative measures like SCAR or BRIAM, quantitative measures like carbon footprint analysis, or even on a smaller scale, the, the, simply the narrative you communicate to your customers, i.e., this chair you're sitting on was reclaimed from a local church. So you look at assessment, then you look at um, operational carbon, i.e. energy efficiency, your water, electricity, gas, how can you minimize what you're using through the spec of your equipment? Um, and then you look at embodied carbon, so i.e. where are we getting stuff from? Um, how can we minimize the footprint of that? Are we using sustainably sourced timber? Are we upcycling um, furniture that already exists and therefore has a lower carbon footprint? And then we look at other things like layout design and flexibility. I think there's a really interesting idea that ties into this restorative restaurant project that we need to design restaurants and spaces in general that are more flexible because we need to allow for, I mean, we've, we've all discovered in the last six months that um, businesses can have to change quite rapidly. Um, and when we've designed spaces in the past, we haven't always allowed for that level of flexibility and change and if you want to go from a, a fully sit down restaurant to now one where you create um, cook at home meal kits or you have you know 50 percent of your business is delivery or you want to become a co-working space for monday to friday because you know <laughs> all these different ideas you need to have a more flexible way to design so um that's a, that's a core part of what we're looking at and there are a few projects we're working on where we're, we're pulling out some of these principles but what we're seeing already is that within that low impact design middle section there are actually it's not one size fits all you actually need to adjust the approach depending on what you're trying to do you know if you're a high-end restaurant you need to look in, in one way than if you're an independent cafe if you're taking over a brand new developer sh shell you have a completely different approach than if you're inheriting a restaurant fit out from someone else. So that that's kind of been an interesting discovery for us. And then the last piece of that circle, stage three, is designing for end of life. And mm. that's, that's the bit that is really interesting from our perspective is if we want to try and connect up the circle, one of the problems at the moment is you can specify like a, a countertop with 80% recycled content in brilliant well done you know that's lower um lower carbon you know it's well sourced lower vocs great if you then glue that to, to mm. a piece of plywood or you know another substrate or fix it in a way where it can't be taken apart then you've created a monstrous hybrid as mm. um they describe in cradle to cradle where you've got this thing with that can't now be kept in its highest value and then it's going to go in the skip because you can't do anything you can't do anything with it so as designers what we need to do is we need to design for disassembly as much as possible we need to design so that materials can come apart so that further down the line they could be reused so the next person coming along on their demolition and strip out phase can make intelligent decisions and and not have to throw that stuff away um, so that's the goal. So you look at design for disassembly. We look at uh, manufacturer take back schemes. You know, are, is someone going to come along and will they take those carpet tiles back, for example? Mm. And there are some people that do that. Um, or you look at how you can move from um, ownership to, to renting. So the kind of subscription economy is really interesting. So there's some people we're talking to with 
you can you look at a model with rather than you buying all of your restaurant chairs and tables do you lease them and mm. then the person that builds them has the responsibility to maintain them they're going to build them in a different way because it's going to be on them to maintain them they're going to need to be durable they're going to want to be able to take them at the end of their life and recover them or reuse them or use those materials again so the, the manufacturer becomes incentivized to to make those um, products in a different fashion so again it's that that, that design piece is really important um, or you have a demonstrated way that you can use that material at its end of life there's another scheme a charity it can go to or something where it's going to extend that life on so we have a duty as designers to be thinking about that and what's really interesting is how that ties to circular economy is you start getting this idea of citizenship and stewardship that you know the, the lifespan that you might be involved with something is not the is not the be all and end all and actually your duty exists beyond that um and uh, it's it's hard because a lot of those systems don't exist at the moment. Um, and we are really searching for more and more suppliers and partners and clients and landlords that can that buy into this vision so that we can create more of that ecosystem and more of those loops. Um, but it is something that we, we really believe in um, and all built on the, on the principles of the circular economy. That wasn't a very short answer to no, the question, No, it was not. Was it? Uh, but there were some really good nuggets in there. One, <laughs> one, uh, one of the things I was, I was thinking as you were talking, because it, this is probably a bit more about how the uh, commercial environment will um, look as we uh, go forward. As you said, there's going to be a lot of empty shops out there. And I think actually what you will see, uh, and I had an interview with Elian Acey from Tamwell Capital, where he said like the landlord is going to be the next institutional investor into the sector mm. so this is also their opportunity to think that in as a demand yeah as they get concept in this actually that how are you actually going to fit this out is this actually environmentally right done where do you actually get your products from who is your you know how what do you do with food waste yeah how are you going to handle that and i think there's going to be and this is just me thinking this is going to happen i think it, it it will be part of the the product of a building a landlord wants to Definitely. supply we here at uh, uh, x plus uh, innovation hub today where yeah. they have thought about that with their suppliers and so on yeah. so how is actually you know how do we actually set these demands out already already in the lease definitely you know I mean? and i think and also because it's going to be the landlord it's going to maybe be investor not even in the yeah. in the building and in your shop or retail unit. They're also maybe going to be an investor in your business because they believe that your business will be good for their portfolio. Yeah, I mean, that that is really an interesting point you make there because it highlights the importance and positivity of partnership and collaboration because mm. as soon as the landlord would become involved in the success of your business, I mean, people have already talked about this in terms of leases and rents, right? The whole The whole idea of moving towards turnover rents means that the the pleasure and the pain is shared between the partnerships so it's it's more in even more in the, the landlord's interest to see a business thrive within the space and if they are responsible as you say for, for the fit out then they're going to be asking those questions of flexibility so how do we actually deal with this if this restaurant doesn't succeed you know, how, how have we designed it to allow for those changes to happen um, and yeah, that, those are the conversations that we, um, you know, expect to be having more and more. Is is how we can join those things up. Yeah, and I I think that uh, it's again it's interesting. You you think like landlords. Um, just as we start discussing this, I haven't thought about this before, but actually they could actually be you know, like the 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 savers of the industry, not saving things that shouldn't be saved, but they could actually set the industry in a new mm. way because they need a new way to fill their empty properties and do things so actually this could be actually a way of you know and, and think circular economy in it again that you actually you know reduce waste you know wouldn't it be sad if we walk through the west end in a six months time and we just see that they've been stripped out all these beautiful there's a lot of beautiful units yeah um just being stripped out uh and uh thrown in the, in the tip and just not being you know utilized mm. all that great effort that's been in, in in and maybe even not even stripping them out just leave them as they are and rebrand as you can with very small efforts yeah exactly i think there, there will be huge opportunities for that um over the next six to twelve months uh, and i've talked about this um a little bit before um, and I think it's um, just key that people keep in mind you don't get blinkered by the potential cost savings. It's really important, but 
I always say that the first thing you need to do as a business to be sustainable is to still be in business in five years time and 10 years time because the energy and effort of starting any venture if you, if that was all wasted after a year because you failed then that that's not a that's not that's not really going to work at all so if you're going to come in and take over a space there is a lot to be said again in this idea of psychological signaling you need to make sure you signal change to your new customers because your customers don't care whether you spent ten thousand pounds or you know a million pounds they want to feel like you've you've made an effort to to win their business so you will certainly see i'm sure some good and bad examples over the next 12 months of people who have understood how you can work with an existing space and existing fit out and changed it enough that their dna is running through it Mm -hmm. um and you'll see some examples where people don't do that and i i fully suspect that customers will will not will not buy into that at all so so as we are in, in the hospitality sector, you talked about waste as well. Yes. And food waste has been on the agenda, and there's a lot of people trying to drive that agenda about around waste. Definitely, uh, and I think it's a really interesting point that um, if you look at the environmental impact of a hospitality business, there's a statistic I, I got, and I can't remember where I got it from, but I think it's from the SRA, but 50 to 75% of the negative impacts um, a hospitality business has comes from its food. Mm. So that is your big opportunity, like you're saying, to make a difference. And, you know, in, in the times we live in, we've already seen, you know, I think there's a, maybe a, a more has been a financial decision actually to, to strip back your menu and actually focusing on, on that core of what people have, even because you maybe had to reconfigure it into delivery or mm. you needed to uh, just have, you had less hands so you couldn't produce your 40 items, you need to strip it down. And you even saw McDonald's at some point have a very skeleton menu and actually that's actually because then your your waste also get different when because we have been obsessed about people want all this choice and funny enough i'm involved in a project where we found out that what the customer didn't want was choice <laughs> they just want the apple solution they want that yeah. phone they know it works they don't have to think about it they just power it on and same comes with food mm-hmm. sometimes i don't want to think too much on it i just want to know what's on that plate it's yeah. good for me and it's good for the planet it's interesting, yeah, because I guess people do want choice, but we always think people want choice within our business. Mm. If you're a hospitality concept, they have choice because they have lots of others. They want to know what place you occupy in their mind. So often, yeah, it is a case of simplifying that is, particularly if you're if you're known for a, a food product rather than experience, then you should stick to the, the food product, right? Because that's the main thing. But I think food, food waste is is really an interesting area in terms of circularity. I mean, there are there are great pioneers like Douglas McMaster at Silo. He does a really interesting thing in trying to make that circularity exist within that single unit. So and he's quite famous for you know a kitchen that's got no bin. That, yeah. That is really is an interesting idea. I think another way is if you want to look at uh, trying to look at a slightly bigger scale, it's interesting the way Adam Handling talks about his group of restaurants. I mean, like everyone, I know he's having challenges at the the moment. Um, but he talks about how how do you square sustainability and food waste with the idea of luxury? You know, if you've got a five star hotel and a guest wants a lobster at three o'clock in the morning, then you need to be geared up as a hospitality concept to deliver that but that creates a huge amount of waste and he looked at therefore setting up ugly butterfly which was a food concept where a restaurant whereby they used this waste food from the hotel as their core set of ingredients to repurpose that and turn that into something else and that for me is really interesting because it comes back to that collaboration ecosystem idea that we don't have to just look at circular economy within our own you know small single business we can actually look at how we connect up and solve these problems through this collaboration and partnership um, which in one way makes it more exciting and then also makes it more more difficult to get our head around because it's more complex but um, it's a really interesting way of looking at things yeah and doc um, which started out here in brighton now moved to to, to hackney um, it's a great example there's also you know the, the danish noma which really also is about what can you get in the seasons, what can you get in the, the nature around you, and how can you forage more, and actually you, what you get home, that's your that's your menu, and then you adapt that menu, and again, and you happily go to those places and tell you what to eat. 
if you have to eat ants, you eat ants mm. because you just trust that. And on top of it, I think you'll see more of it also like a supply chain will be under pressure from a food point of view that actually restaurants, you know, there will maybe be a part of it that's a set menu, but be very rooted in what they can actually get locally. And then you Definitely. will see that, you know, they had specials on with special seasons because we need to go back a bit again to think about you cannot always get strawberries because it's not doesn't give sense to eat strawberries all year round in December no in no, December absolutely not and uh, maybe you shouldn't be eating a, a mango uh, as well all the time maybe definitely not air freighted mango because that's a and I think there's a lot of waste there and I think there's a the really interesting work that's been done by what I'm looking at circular economy like IKEA the, the furniture mm. manufacturer I think they even think about now how can they take furnitures back and recycle them because they know they have a massive responsibility yeah. for that. But also when you look at a part of their food business and to people, what I, I care to do with food, they have a, a lot of restaurants yeah. that create a lot of food waste and they actually got involved. So they brought on one of the first big things they did, of course, to set out the strategy, but then they have this technology from Winnow, it's a UK technology company that's actually helping with have like an AI scale. So you actually, you track what you throw out and they have started adapting the menu from what that goes in that bin. So it's a camera actually taking pictures of the food that's come down and registered. And really you've seen Winnow also gone into big cruise ships and, and they're focusing on where food is massive of scale. So an individual restaurant will also benefit for having this, but yeah. actually where the technology is really interesting is where you cater for a lot of people like in hotels, cruise ships, Ikeas, like massive catering operations. Um, and then suddenly you get data on it because, you know, we have an overproduction of, of food and we will talk about that when we come to the no planet B. So you will be shocked that actually you have more than double the amount of food that we need as individuals and humans and, and animals to feed ourselves. So we're just throwing all that out, all the energy we are trying to use that. And I think, uh, as you said, uh, I didn't know there was a number of 75%. So that's actually where you can make one of your biggest commitment to climate. Definitely. As a restaurateur. Exactly. And I think if someone wants to look into that more, I mean, most people will have heard of the Sustainable Restaurant Association. And um, a few months into lockdown, they came out with um, a, a circular restaurant guide or circular guide for restaurants. I can't remember how they titled it. But if you look on their website, there is a, a guide to talk you through the whole world of running a restaurant so how you look at you know food sourcing food waste um e you know, energy efficiency um h how you look at creating a more circular food business you know it's a it's a decent pdf it's like 30 pages long um and there's a lot of tips and case studies and examples in there so i think if anyone is really keen to look into circular economy and think about how it might work for their business that would be a, a great resource to, to we'll put to that in the, uh, the show notes yeah that would be good yeah um i think also there's uh, something around again you know there's uh, also you know the, there's other people that are already taking massive steps forward this as uh, dan barber in new york having his uh, the fourth plate he's calling this book is called the fourth plate but his restaurant has all all over years a bit like silo adapted to that you know we we mm. only able to source things from a local point mm. of view so again another touch point and i know it's a high-end restaurant and it's a bit like the tesla thing i said to people you know you need sometimes when you can get it working i know it's a different price point up there but then now our, our job is to think about how do we take it so it's not only on you know high-end dining michelin restaurants and i think start taking this yeah. down the food chain and actually that ikea is trying to do it yeah so 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 it's, it's possible uh to do that and how do you actually start to actually involve that into your day-to-day -day operation because if you were selling chicken burgers can you actually do something yeah. like that you can make sure that you have maybe technology that make sure you don't produce more chicken burgers than you need yeah on the spot instead of having waste on it or you don't take it so much food or buns out of the freezer actually it's going to be thrown out yeah so it's about a uh, you know technology and operational standards as well and how you actually involve that into your business yeah i think it's really interesting it just reflecting what you're saying about high-end restaurants doing it and it it touches on a point for me that i i think i've mentioned before or probably in some linkedin posts sustainability in a way when people talk about it they, they tend to either talk about the, the moral argument like you should be more sustainable like we we should be more sustainable as, as a as people or the kind of rational logical argument of well it just makes sense to be more sustainable but 
we all know human beings don't necessarily respond to that. You know, I I should be fitter than I am. I probably should weigh <laughs> half a stone, a stone less than I do. But, uh, you know, I, I don't because the rational, logical argument does not um, outweigh the emotional draw of a, of a nice biscuit. <laughs> um, so, But I, I think one thing you look at um, high-end restaurants leading with sustainability is we need to almost tap into the baser desires of human beings, the desire for status, the desire for superiority, and associate that with these qualities of sustainability. And I think if we can do that by leading, you know, great restaurants like Silo um, and the, the fourth plate you mentioned yeah. there, I think um, that actually is really important because we need we you kind of need to make sustainability sexy because in in some ways you're right we're going back to some core principles about sourcing local working with the seasons all these things that that make a huge amount of sense and we're not really innovating we're kind of undoing all the the you know the kind of craziness that we've maybe thought about in the last uh, few hundred years but there are other examples as well because one thing with circular economy is that sometimes people can think it's about upcycling or just making do and mending and and those loops of repairing and looking after things and building things to last are definitely there but there's also you know a kind of you can create kind of premium lovely luxury things out of it there's a there's a company called um goldfinger factory here they're a social enterprise uh, based in london and they create new pieces of furniture like loose furniture or joinery with a lot for hospitality um, businesses where they upcycle the materials, but, but they don't really like the word upcycle. What they do is they get like old fixtures from John Lewis or some old flooring from the Science Museum. And then they will turn that, you know, with a, what a fantastic crafts, craftsman who works there. And they turn it into these beautiful, beautiful tables and chairs and bits of joinery. And they're just, they're just lovely things that happen to have a deeply rooted, sustainable story to them. Yeah, and I think that's that's the thing to really see from my perspective is that there is a lot there can be a lot of creativity and a lot of ways that you can embed this thinking of circular economy into the way you um, approach your brand, and that you can also, as you've said, you can you can approach it from uh, an idea of, or an angle of scale, like you know IKEA, um, or you can approach it from a, a very one-off um, example, like Silo, which, which are coming at things from very different angles. Yeah, uh, I think it's super, super interesting when you say that again, because it comes with it like, you know, there has to be look look beautiful in a way. Yeah, and um, unashamedly so. And if you take it down to food, it's not enough that it's vegan yeah. and plant-based. It actually has to taste delicious because yeah. that's actually emotional how we, we, we take food. If you Definitely. create a, a bland kind of thing. But it's good for you. I mean, It's good for you. It's not enough no. as a human being. It could be maybe, you know, while you're a diet and you're, you're on that yeah. mission and then, you know, the diet goes out the window one day. Uh, so the super, super behavior of actually creating food that's actually delicious and yeah. actually plant-based food can be extremely delicious if you know how you do it. If it's yeah. a bit like a skill uh, and suddenly the meat is not to send us the plate and there's actually other things. To mm. It's great vegetables. Great vegetables that's, you know, grown in, in healthy soil taste absolutely amazing on mm. their own so if the consumer can get hands on that you get hands on it. and then we come back to um, you talk about elitism around that there's these elite restaurants uh that's doing this right now but actually our biggest challenge as people within the food industry is how do we make great food because it, it's actually you know i would call it almost um uh, an obligation to make great food available for everyone. It, mm. should, it should be a right that we all have access to great food. And the reality is, and I think like Iceland nailed it very well on the the Good Business um, Festival yesterday. That the CEO he said, well, the problem is that uh, the, the the poor people in this country, and we're trying to get them the best product we can create to them for the money they have available for food. Because actually, they actually care about. Mm these things as well. They care about the planet. They care about how their kids eat, but they are so under pressure, their food budget is a fraction of what the, the average middle class person's mm. food budget is. So th what do they have for a week? Let's say they have 20 pounds for a week to feed a family of five. So you just, all the, the challenges come that. So they actually, they're interested in helping that, but they, they just have to look at their wallet, wallet and say, what can we afford? Yeah. So Iceland actually would love to do other things if they couldn't afford it again. But then how do we actually help that affordability when it comes to, to food as well? And how do we bring better products 
out in front of people. And again, I think I think a lot of restaurants as we come back as well. That is this a bit more. I see it. It will become a lot about you know. It will become probably become a bit more expensive to go in a restaurant, mm. but you probably also get a better product. That's a bit my hope because they will think about what they put on that plate. Has to be authentic. In many yeah, cause it's because that's unfortunate because we've we've tended to push towards um the the, the unsustainability of things has often been driven by the, the, the need to reduce costs or the perceived yeah. need to reduce costs. Or convenience. Yeah, and convenience. And actually, if you look at, you know, I can't remember again, I saw a, a post on LinkedIn and, and they were saying like, you know, actually the cost of apples should be, you know, 160% of what they actually are. The cost of beef should be 300% of what it is. If you're going to do things the right way and, and think about how things are grown and, and that the whole idea of ties into regenerative ag- agriculture that if you want to do things properly if you want to rotate your crops if you want to not have um you know, the highest density monocultures um grown everywhere then you need to grow things that will just cost a bit more a mo- bit more money um and and how you square that with the the race to make things as cheap as possible is is clearly not really been not really worked out so far which kind of comes back to your original point there but i think yeah circular economy i guess we should probably what, start wrapping yeah. up now on this i think if, if anyone wants to look at any more complex um no that's no, not right some deeper ideas there's a couple of interesting books one's called circular economy a wealth of flows which is by one of the guys who um is a founding member of the ellen MacArthur foundation Another one called Cradle to Cradle, which is uh, subtitled Remaking the Way We Make Things. Um, it's by uh, Michael Browngart and William McDonough. And uh, th- those are both uh, really good uh, really good resources if you want to get deeper on the subject. But the SRA guide will probably be the most directly accessible and relevant for, for most of our listeners, I'd hope. Yeah, and I think this is here where, you know, as an industry, we can make massive impact yeah even in hard times and actually it will financially actually benefit us to start working with those menus and think about the food waste within them so that Definitely. i love it because of its tangible and i love tools as people know i know i love when i can go and do something about mm. things good thank you uh, david for another interesting conversation yeah, um, it was good So that's the end for today thank you so much for listening we really hope that it sparked off an idea or two for you We'll make sure to include any links and references in the show notes. But if you'd like to start a conversation, you can email michael at hospitalitymavericks.com or david at objectspaceplace.com. You can also find them roaming around on LinkedIn, so feel free to connect. Finally, if you're enjoying this series, please consider letting the world know by honouring us with a five-star rating or even giving us a review. Okay, goodbye for now. Catch you next time for more discussions on hospitality and the infinite game.